How many different ways can a married couple claim Social Security? What percentage of retirees still have a mortgage? And what can you do if you aren't on track to retire? We'll answer these questions and more on this, the 50th episode of the Dough Roller Podcast. Welcome to the Dough Roller Podcast, where the best thing money can buy is financial freedom. We help you make more, spend less, and invest the rest. And now your host, Rob Berger. Whether you're just starting out, buried under a mountain of debt, or well on your way to financial freedom, this is the podcast to help you take your finances to the next level. Hey everybody, welcome to the 50th episode of the Dough Roller Podcast. I have a great show for you today. We've got Emily Birkin on the show. She is an author of The Five Years Before You Retire. That's what we're going to be talking about today. What should you be doing? What plans should you be making? What issues should you be thinking about? as you are in that red zone, as she calls it, those few years before retirement. We're going to talk about her book and talk about those issues uh, today uh, in, on the show. And uh, because of that, I picked a, a money tool of the day that is uh, highly relevant to retirement, and it's the AARP Social Security Calculator. We're going to be talking a bit with Emily about figuring out when you should take Social Security. You know, in the in the in the opening questions, I asked how many different ways can married couples claim Social Security. You won't believe the answer. It's unbelievable to me. Uh, we'll we'll talk about that with Emily. Uh, but the tool of the day is a free calculator that can help you determine when it's best to take Social Security. I've worked through it before, uh, although I'm still a number of years away. Uh, from actually uh, claiming Social Security. But I will leave a link to this tool in the show notes. It's a free tool. They have paid tools, uh, and um, there there can be some actually very sophisticated software programs, and we talked with with Emily about that in the interview today. But if you wanted sort of a a quick uh, assessment of, of, of when it might be best to claim Social Security benefits, check out the AARP uh, free calculator. And as I said, I will leave a link uh, in the show notes to that calculator. So with that, uh, let's turn now to the interview with Emily. Emily, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me. So we were just chatting uh, a few minutes before uh, we started the podcast. So um, we talked about a small world. You're in Indiana now, but you actually spent some time in Columbus, Ohio and taught at Grove City High School. I did, yes. I was an English teacher at Grove City High School for four years. And that's significant to me because I grew up in Grove City. My mom still lives there. And uh, so there you go, small world. Well, listen, uh, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, we're going to talk about your book, which I thought was fantastic and incredibly comprehensive, uh, The Five Years Before You Retire. Before we get to the book, though, why don't you just tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Uh, well, I am a personal finance blogger, primarily. Um, I have been doing this for about four years. Uh, I uh, write on any number of topics from budgeting to retirement um, to you know saving for college. Uh, so pretty much anything finance related, uh, I'm your girl. Uh, and so that's something that I've been doing for a little while. And last year, I had the opportunity to write the five years before you retire uh, to help people get ready for retirement in that red zone where you know that it's coming, but you're not, not exactly sure what to do since so much out there is about how to save more for retirement. They don't really tell you what to do once you've done all that saving. Right. So um, that was an opportunity I had last year, and it's been uh, an incredible ride. I, I, I had a lot of fun writing the book, and, and now it's out and having some fun promoting it. Right, sure. And I got a ton of questions for you about the book. I'm curious, you said you, you, know, uh, you write for personal finance blogs. Who do you, who do you write for? Uh, there's a number of them. Um, Widespread, PT Money, um, Money Ning, Money Crashers, um, and the Dollar Stretcher are some of my main sites. Although you can see me other places uh, every once in a while. I've been on uh, Huffington Post and Yahoo Finance, among other places. That, that, that's great. You know, um, I've been in the personal finance blogging sh- sphere since 2007, and I know all of those blogs you've mentioned. They're all great websites, and folks ought to check them out. And I know the bloggers behind them. It's kind of mm-hmm. a small, tight, tight-knit community. Very small community, yeah. yes. And you, you work with FinCon, right? Do you do I some? I do. Yeah. And yes. F- you're right. Um, I was the main blogger for FinCon's uh, blog uh, in 2013. Um, so, and that's a, a relationship that uh, just continues to grow. I have a uh, um, great deal of respect for uh, Philip Taylor from PT Money, who's FinCon. Right. 
Yeah, I know Phil very well, and he uh, obviously started FinCon, and which has been a, just a wonderful conference for personal fin- finance bloggers. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, it's been a great way to build a community. So, Okay, so my first question about your book is this. How did you come up with the idea of the book? Because you hear, like you said a moment ago, so many people talk about either saving for retirement or maybe once you're in retirement. But mm-hmm. your book focuses, as you said, the red zone, which is a great way to think about it, the five years before retirement. How did you come up with that idea? Well, uh, the idea really came from uh, the fact that uh, there's so much information out there that seems to conflict. So, for instance, I had a friend last year who was telling me her husband was turning 65, and um, she heard from three different places, all of them semi-official, what he needed to do to sign up for Medicare. And he, she just was not sure what to believe, what was true, what was not true. And so uh, the, the idea came that I wanted to create a resource that would give all of that information in one place without it being overwhelming so that people could say, okay, here's what I need to do in order to be ready for this. Uh, because with so many different aspects of retirement, um, there's a lot of information. Some of it is good. Some of it is not good. And it just takes a lot to wade through it. And my idea was to provide all of that information in one place so that people who are in their, their early 60s or a few years from retirement aren't um, trying to page through all the, the information on uh, how to start a 401k and, and how to find more money in their budget to, to put aside when what they really need to know is, okay, how do I sign up for Medicare? Uh, what can I expect um, from Social Security? And those sorts of questions. Yeah, the thing that struck me about your book is the scope of it. I mean, it really covers, like you just mentioned a couple, Social Security and Medicare. I mean, it, you, you, know, you could probably have a whole book on each of those topics, and yet you're, you're able to boil it down into a way that's very easy to read, but goes far beyond that. Because you, know, you cover annuities, re- you know, reverse mortgages, whether you <laughs> should have debt when you retire, and if you do, what can you do about it? What if you don't have enough saved? And we're going to you know, we're going to cover some of those topics uh, today, but the scope of it, I I thought was very impressive. And I'm just curious, how long did it take you to write this book? Uh, It was about four months, four or five months. That's amazing. (laughs) I got to tell you, that's amazing. Uh, Some of this is because I had been blogging for a while. um, These are all topics that I had written on in the past. So I could draw on some of my research from, from the past for that. Um, and so some of it comes from that. Some of it comes from the fact that uh, I have been writing for my entire life. So, you know, when I get down to it, if I know what I'm going to say, boom, I can write it. Yeah. Uh, so the research definitely did take longer than the writing aspect of it. Yeah, I bet. Um, I bet. But, uh, but because I had had some background in it, um, I, I was able to uh, start from a place where I wasn't uh, completely at sea. Uh, I knew basically what I needed to, to look up and where I needed to go to get the information. Right. And I'm just curious, when you, when you sat down to write the book, what was your, what was your daily schedule like? Had, were you writing eight hours a day or for five months? Or uh, no, I, I, I ask as someone who I consider myself a failed author because I have all these <laughs> book ideas that have never actually you know, made their way to a book. Um, well, it's, uh, it, it actually all... Uh, Tied to it was, uh, my my son's school schedule. I have a three year old uh, who was two last year as I was writing this, uh, and he goes to Montessori, and it's uh, I had to write while he was at Montessori, so that was um, helpful and infuriating at the same time <laughs> because I I was forced to write during the time that I had the house to myself because uh, I knew nothing was going to get done while he was home, um, but it was also infuriating because you just get right into the zone and realize oh I have to go pick him up. <laughs> Uh, but generally, he was at, uh, at, was at a uh, the Montessori camp actually over the summer, which is when I wrote the majority of it. For I believe it was six hours a day, so I had about, about six hours a day to work, and of that, uh, about four of it was was writing. Um, two was puttering. <laughs> I tell you, I wish I had your discipline. That's amazing. Well, thank um, you. See, I, I don't have an excuse. I don't have my. You know, our children are out, or we're empty nesters, so I've got no excuses. Uh, that's that's fantastic. Uh, okay, well, let's jump into the book. And you know, as I mentioned, it, it covers so much. You know, I, I, I won't be able to, you know, look at and talk about every um, aspect of it. It's just, it's really comprehensive. Mm-hmm. But a number of things really caught my attention, and, and uh, one of them is towards the beginning of the book. You know, you focus on are you, you're maybe five years away from retirement. Let's say, are you on track to retire? Do you have enough money? And you talk about sort of a savings gap and the savings return factor. And, and ha- formulas that people can use to figure out if they have enough to retire or where they are. Can you kind of just walk us through how that works? 
Sure. Uh, well, one thing I want to say is uh, part of the reason why people are so frightened of saving for retirement and, and planning for retirement is because they don't know where they stand. And to me, I look at it in the same way as uh, when you start a weight loss regimen. The hardest thing you can do is get on the scale and see where you are. And that's the same thing with uh, with saving for retirement. The, the very hardest thing is finding out where you are because you're so afraid of what the uh, what the reality is going to be. Uh, and oftentimes you'll find that it's it, you're better off than you think you are. You might step on the scale and like, oh, I only gained 15 pounds, not the 20 I thought. <laughs> um, and it's the same way. Like, oh, I don't actually need you know a million dollars. I I, I can I can make do with uh, 700,000 and I'll, I'll be fine. Now uh, the thing is that's still an overwhelming amount, but once you know where you are, you can make a plan to get to where you need to be. So um, the the first thing you really need to do is figure out how much you need to retire. Uh, There are multiple ways to do that, and that's something that I walk you through in the book, um, is figuring out how much you can count on in retirement through things like Social Security and if you have some sort of pension, and then figuring out how much that you would need to to live on uh, and feel comfortable, and figure out what that gap is between uh, what you can count on through Social Security and pensions or or any other um, uh, income you have coming in that is guaranteed, and what you need to save um, uh, put aside. And so once you have that number, then you can start figuring out what you need to do to get there if you're not there yet. So again, all of this is a little, little overwhelming, a little frightening. It's, it's stepping on that scale. You just don't want to do it. It's a lot easier to be like, oh, I'll think about it tomorrow. I'll think about it tomorrow. But the, the best thing you can do is, is do that as soon as you can. Get peel off the band aid, you know, just just uh, just tear it off, and then go from there because you can't figure out what you need to do unless you know where you are right now. Right, right. And I know in the book, if, if for folks that get the book and read it, you walk them through step by step how to do this whole process of you know mm-hmm. what your secure social security benefits might be, pension, what that gap is, you know, maybe you need whatever. $75,000 a year and Social Security and pensions provide. I'm just making numbers up, but 40. Mm-hmm. So you've got that gap of 35,000 that you need. Now, how much should you have saved to generate that mm-hmm. 35,000? And of course, that depends on assumptions about market returns and you have different assumptions that folks can choose and then there's multiples and you walk through all that. Um, one of the things you do that I was that I found interesting is rather than using some sort of rule of thumb about how much you need, like you know eighty percent of your salary, that's a common one that you hear. You actually suggest that people walk through and figure out a budget, and you've got mm-hmm. budget worksheets, and you 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 also have sources, you know, other websites that you uh, mention in there that folks can go to. Why did you do it that way? Why did you have sort of a step by step budget plan versus just a, a rule of thumb, whatever eighty percent of, of of income? Uh, I feel like rules of thumb are really good for uh, when you are saving for retirement in your early years of working, you know, for for 20, 30, 40, 50 somethings. Then once you get closer to retirement, a rule of thumb is just too general um, because, you know, if you haven't met that rule of thumb, you know, okay, what do I do now? What do I do now? You get a little overwhelmed. Um, so at, at the point where you're actually looking towards the, um, the, the actual start of your retirement, you need to know specific dollars and cents because that's what you're going to be living. You don't live a rule of thumb. You live your specific budget. You live your day-to-day, how much you spend, um, how much you are able to save by doing X, Y, or Z. So um, I feel... It's much better to be specific and particular. Uh, that's also because uh, you know I write a lot of articles and I read a lot of uh, financial articles, and um, we writers love rules of thumb because then you can say, "Oh, you need to do this. The math is easy," and boom, you've got a 500-word article that gives some good information, but not specific information. And no one is uh, is going to be able to retire based on the kinds of short 500 word articles I've written, we've all written, um, and that we read everywhere that have those like, okay, save, um, save 80% of your, your, uh, your income. That's what you should plan for. So I, I wanted to make sure that this was something that would work for pretty much anyone on any budget uh, to be able to figure out what they can do and how their retirement will look. Yeah. It does seem like the right way to go because if, if for among many reasons, 
you know, everyone's situation is different. You know, you, some folks may be a few years away from retirement and still paying a mortgage, while others could have their home paid off mm-hmm. or living with family. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, the, the, and that's just one issue. I mean, you, you multiply that by any countless number of issues, and and uh, uh, um, you really need to to figure out the details. And I suspect that a lot of people, if they go through that exercise in your book, may find out that they need uh, a lot less than what the rules of thumb suggest. Yes. Yes, that's something else um, because rules of thumb are set for pretty much anyone anywhere in the country. So someone who has lived their entire life in New York City is going to need a much different amount uh, to retire than someone who has lived their entire life here in Lafayette, Indiana, where um, cost of living is extremely low. So that's something that I feel is is really important um, to make sure that it's people can figure out based on their own situation, not on the situation of someone living on a coast or uh, in a situa- situation completely different from their own. Right, right. Um, good. Okay. Now, let's turn to the, the actually generating income during retirement. And you talk about uh, the 4% rule mm-hmm. and the bucket method. Now, I had I actually had folks on, um, uh, some financial analysts on the show in Podcast 46 from Vanguard, mm-hmm. and we talked extensively about the 4% rule. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is you know pretty well known. I'm curious though, can you describe for us what the bucket method is and how that works? Sure. Uh, for the the bucket method, that is basically you uh, are going to separate out your nest egg into separate buckets um, or or uh, asset allocation is is the the technical term for it. Um, so basically, you've got the bucket for uh, about five years, your first five years of retirement. And in that particular bucket, your assets are going to be in things that are pretty stable, that do not generate a great deal of interest. So things like CDs, treasury bonds, cash equivalents. Uh, then you've got a bucket for years about 5 to 15. And there you can be a little bit more aggressive because you don't need to tap into that until about um, in, for five years or so uh, down the road. So you can um, go into to bonds, some, some of the um, stocks that you know are going to be, um, uh, be pretty stable. And then you've got uh, the final bucket, which is going to be for years 15 through 30. And so with that, since you have so much time before you need to, um, to uh, tap into that, that particular bucket is uh, can be much more aggressive, and you can go after uh, the returns that uh, a younger person who who is still working might be going after with with part of their uh, retirement accounts, and so that allows you to still have growth in retirement. And um, the reason why I like the bucket method is that you are not um, negatively affected by a downturn in the market at any point in your retirement. Uh, For instance, the people who retired in 2008 who were planning on using the 4% rule and had everything just kind of generally diversified instead of a bucket method might have taken a huge hit in 2008 that they would never really be able to recover from unless they continued working and and built it up again. Uh, With the bucket method, uh, you might take a huge hit in part of your your uh, uh, retirement accounts, but you know that some parts of it will be um, set and you can still retire on time and uh, just go through that early bucket that was not affected by the market downturn, um, particularly negatively, and you know that uh, you still have time to rebuild your nest egg. And I take it, you know, in the bucket method, there's some flexibility as to whether it's exactly one to five years for the first bucket and five sure. to 15. Mm-hmm. And I wonder, too, if that might not even change based on market conditions. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are your well, thoughts on that? One of, the, one of the reasons why I like the bucket method is that it forces you to stay uh, – um, on top of your 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 retirements, um, the four percent method. Uh, some people could very easily just you know once a year go. All right, I'm withdrawing four percent, and I'm all done until next year. Uh, whereas with the bucket method, you really do need to. Um, reallocate your assets at least once a year, maybe twice a year, um, and just kind of uh, uh, figure out if everything is where you need it to be uh, and uh, just go ahead and, and, um, and move money around if you need to. Uh, and that is something that I think is very, very uh, important and powerful. I think that people need to stay on top of that and, and actively manage their money. Uh, now, 
I do want to say with the caveat, I am a big believer in having a financial planner um, partnering with with an advisor who can help you make those decisions because those are not the sorts of decisions that any lay person is going to be able to do easily just off the top of their head. Um, however, partnering with a financial planner, meeting with them once or twice a year um, to manage the accounts uh, will allow you to maximize your money. Uh, and I feel like it will allow you to um, retire with less in the bank uh, than necessarily uh, they might suggest because you can actively manage it and make sure that you have what you need each year. And I feel that that's much um, wiser for people so that they don't get to you know age 87 and go, oh my goodness, I'm out of money. Yeah, yeah. They'll know where they are. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not to the point yet uh, where I need to, you know, I'm not five years from retirement. Mm -hmm. uh, but I am thinking about it, and I do like the bucket method. You know, when you think about asset allocation while you're saving, it's always based on percentages, or usually. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you might have 70% in stocks and 30% in bonds, mm -hmm. or, or whatever your asset allocation is. Um, what you're suggesting, and I've read about the bucket method in other contexts, is it's it's really the same asset allocation, but you're not breaking it up based on on some percentage. Mm -hmm. You're basing you're breaking it up based on a, a number of years of living expenses. Yes. Right. Yes. And I suppose you could do all of that and still follow some form of the four percent rule because I mean, sure. e even though you bucket it, you still have to decide. Okay, I've got these buckets. That's great, um, uh, and they're based in part on your annual expenses. Mm -hmm. But you, uh, there could be some variability in that from year to year. And one year you could decide to take four and a half percent, maybe, and then the next year three and a half. You still have Absolutely. to decide how much you're actually going to take out, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. yes. So, yes. I, yeah, I think that's a great part of the book, and um, uh, I, I think it's a helpful way to think about um, uh, retirement spending, as you said, particularly to uh, avoid those first five years in retirement where the performance in the market can have a huge impact on the, mm -hmm. the likelihood that your money will serve, you know, outlast you, I guess is the goal, right? Um, you also talk about annuities, and I'm curious, you know, one of the things I liked about your book is you didn't say that annuities are good or bad, mm -hmm. uh, and it's true with all of this. You, you, you often have this, this um, table that has the pros and cons, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I think that, to me, that's really the best way to write about personal finance because there is no hard and fast right answer for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you did the same thing with annuities. I'm curious, who do you think can benefit from annuities. What you know? What are the big pros and cons of taking you know annuitizing some portion of your your assets during retirement? Mm -hmm. Well, for for me, I like to. I think that um, oftentimes personal finance writers and economists tend to um, like take the psychology out of money. Uh, and uh, because you know they're able to look at it very rationally and, and straightforward, and if you you look at it that way, then annuities might not make sense uh, for any number of people. Um, for me, I remember and I want to remember that uh, that money and psychology are very intimately connected. Um, we have these weird views of money that, like, money is it, it causes our brains to scramble. And so annuities in particular uh, are going to be great for those people who do not want to manage their money, who the idea of doing that gives them the shivers. I mean, it just makes them feel overwhelmed and, and frightened and they just don't want to do it. Uh, and that they're not wrong for feeling that way. So um, if they can find an annuity that's going to work for them, that will allow them to basically continue to collect what seems like a paycheck and continue along in the way that has worked for them the entire time that they were working. Um, you know, there are people who are perfectly capable of budgeting uh, their paychecks, but who the idea of investments is just uh, a bridge too far. Mm. So um, there is absolutely nothing wrong for individuals in that situation to annuitize some part of their retirements. Uh, now, I would never recommend annuitizing everything um, because, you know, diversifying is important in every aspect of what you're doing, not just uh, in investments. Um, but having that uh, that amount that you can count on each month through an annuity is uh, going to be so helpful and so um, uh, de-stressing for the individuals who just don't like the idea of dealing with their investments. Yeah, that, that's a great point. You know, that's something I've learned from blogging because to my mind, you know, you know, investing, it's so easy. You get a couple of funds from Vanguard, asset allocation is easy and you, you invest. Mm -hmm. But I've talked to enough people to realize that there are folks that just, you know, they just start to get real nervous and uneasy with all of that. 
it reminds me, I wrote an article about um, this, the psychology of money. It was, I forget the title, but it had to do with Mr. Spock and, uh, and Captain Kirk. And there's, you know, there's a, there's a little bit of Spock in all of us, the logical, mm-hmm. let's open up a spreadsheet, we can figure this out. Mm-hmm. And then Captain Kirk comes in with all his emotion and, and whatnot. <laughs> He's, you know, he, 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 he goes against the odds and of course it mm-hmm. always worked out. But uh, yeah, the psychology of money is important and it, it seems like a good way to use annuities, at least for part of your uh, mm-hmm. retirement, particularly if you're not comfortable with, you know, managing your money, uh, all of it, um, investing it, you know, I guess it gives you some security. As you said, there are some downsides to it, uh, to annuities as well. Um, but I liked the way you covered that in the book. I thought it was very good. Um, Thank you. The, the other thing that struck me, now I'm, gonna, I'm moving to a different, different topics. I'm kind of touching on a couple of them because your book covers so much, and that's Social Security. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's a great section in the book. But the one thing that struck me is you said there are 81 different ways. If I understood what you said, there are 81 different ways to take Social Security for married couples. Did I get that right? That's correct, yes. I mean, exp- just exp- at a high level, explain that, because that just seems mind-numbing, 81 different ways to take Social Security. Uh, yes. So basically, um, with uh, with married couples, because there are so many different variables as to who is older, who made more money, um, and, and that sort of thing, um, there are different ways that you can take uh, your Social Security in order to maximize uh, your checks. So for instance, um, let's say uh, my husband and I are two years apart. He, uh, he's two years older than me. Um, and uh, by the time we reach our Social Security age, if he would like to retire at, say, 65, um, even though full retirement age might be 67, and I want to keep working until I am 68, uh, so that would mean that he would be retiring and now I have to do the math. <laughs> uh, he'd be retiring about uh, five years before yeah. me. Um, so, uh, would it make sense? Uh, the you know these eighty-one ways to, to take retire uh, the Social Security retirement is would it make sense for him to take Social Security right when he retires, or would it make sense for him to wait for a few years? Uh, one of the things that uh, as a possibility is um, I could start taking Social Security when he reaches full retirement age at 67, even though I would only be 65 at the time. Um, And that would allow me to uh, take advantage of his higher salary. And then I would wait to take my retirement until I reached my full retirement age two years later. So that's just an example of it. Um, And yes, it is that complicated. I was saying, you know, I'm kind of a math geek, but this is almost (laughs) overwhelming for me. I'm wondering, are there tools, calculators, um, and maybe you mentioned some in your book, I'm trying to remember back, but Mm -hmm. that, that can help folks actually, you know, sort through the 81 different ways and figure out what's best for them? Uh, there are a few calculators available um, on irs.gov that will um, allow you to, to figure that out. Uh, I'm sorry, not irs, ssa.gov, uh, excuse me, ssa.gov. Um, however, for those particular 81 different ways, um, you are going to need to meet with a financial planner. Uh, there are uh, software um, programs that allow you to figure that out, that where you, you type in the numbers and, and it helps you figure it out. Uh, but they are prohibitively expensive for just a, you know at-home purchase. But a financial planner will have those to, to help you figure it out. Right. Yeah, and I know there are some free calculators like at AARP, mm-hmm. but I, I'm get, and, and, and like you said, the Social Security Administration's website, and I'll leave links to the, all of that in the show notes. Mm-hmm. But um, what I've read is, kind of to your point, they're not as sophisticated as these very expensive yes. programs, and so you're yes. better off just going to a financial planner. And yes. and considering the amount of money that um, uh, you could be leaving on the table if you don't take Social Security in a way that maximizes uh, your benefits, it is worth it, even if you don't in any other way meet with a financial planner. It is worth it to spend the money on uh, pretend possibly just a fee-only financial planner to meet with them once to find out, right. okay, when do we do what, uh, and to get this information. You know, maybe it's because it's tax season, but I get so frustrated that things have to be this complicated. Yes. You know, it's like, I mean, I, I'm sure there's a point to it, and everyone's situation is different, and Social Security is trying to address all the different situations, but that just seems crazy. Okay, well, that's, but the thing is, the real point here is it's good for people to know this. Yes. That this yes. is out there. The other thing I learned is that if you're divorced, you may still be able to get Social Security benefits, depending on the circumstances, from your, your former spouse's uh, income. That's correct. Which yes. is also in your book. And, uh, and so yeah, I learned a lot from that. Um, and the 81 different ways, I, I, it just um, uh, 
boggles the mind, but it's good to know and it's good to plan for it. You, you quoted a statistic about mortgages. 40.5% of households headed by someone 65 to 74 have a mortgage. Mm-hmm. It's not, yeah, for, uh, 40%, which I, I, I would have guessed lower. Yes. So, you know, do you have any tips for folks that are nearing retirement and they know that they're likely to still have their mortgage, what they can do to address that issue? And how, how important is it to address? Maybe you just go into retirement with a mortgage. You know, maybe that's not the end of the world. Uh, and and that is a possibility. Now, that, that's a, um, we've kind of come away from, it used to be a hard and fast rule among our parents and grandparents, you do not retire with a mortgage. You know, you get that paid off before you even think about retirement. Uh, and things are a little different now. I mean, part of it was our, our parents and grandparents bought one house and stayed in it their entire lives. Uh, whereas people nowadays are more likely to move and upgrade houses and that sort of thing, um, which is, is part of the reason why uh, more people are, are retiring with mortgages. Um, so it is not necessarily the end of the world um, if you retire and you still carry a mortgage, if it is something that you can afford. Uh, however, if um, crunching the numbers, your mortgage is going to be eating up a great deal of your retirement income, that is something that you need to deal with. Uh, there's a couple of different things that you can do. Um, downsizing is something that I, I am a, a big proponent of. Um, you know, Do you need the house that you're in? Uh, because not only if you downsize, not only does that mean that you can wipe out your um, your mortgage. You might even be able to get some uh, um, some equity out of your house, which you can add to your retirement, uh, and that that is a really good opportunity for a lot of people. Um, other options out there, um, you can um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, refine. Uh, depending on what that will do, if that's going to change your your, your monthly uh, uh, mortgage enough to make a difference. You said refinancing? Uh, mm-hmm, refinancing, right. okay. yeah. Um, so that's a possibility. Um, and, uh, you know, other possibilities that are a little bit more out there are, you know, could you rent out a room? Um, you know, is, is there a way that you could be making some money uh, to help you pay for your mortgage? Uh, you know, roommates are not just for 20-somethings. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, every, again, every situation is different. I know for from us, for us, I think about definitely downsizing. Mm-hmm. I want to downsize now. I don't want to wait till we retire. But yeah. um, that's for, that's a topic for another podcast. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll have my wife on the show if she can tell you why we're not going to downsize. Um, you know, but uh, you, you, that if you can, I do think downsizing and possibly moving to a cheaper location, depending mm-hmm. on where you live. You know, and, absolutely. And it's not even just housing, but also taxes too. Yes. You know? Yeah. So that's yeah. that's great. Um, okay, so uh, a couple of things before I let you go, and I appreciate your time today. One is we kind of touched on this with the bucket method, but one of the you have a, a, a good list of pitfalls towards the mm-hmm. end of the book. One of them is retiring without your first three years of income set aside. Mm-hmm. So what's the what's the problem of, of why is that a pitfall if you don't have three years of income set aside? Well, um, that's because if you don't have three years uh, of income in a place where you know you know it's safe you know that it is not going to affect the rest of your your nest egg, uh, then if there is some sort of uh, market catastrophe um, right within those first couple of years after retiring, then you are left in a position of, okay, what do I do now? Do I live on a fraction of what I planned on living on this year and next year until things recover? Do I take the money I planned on taking and have a permanent hit? Because again, compound interest, if, if the money's not there, compound interest can't grow. Or I, what do I do? I mean, am I living on, on cat food and ketchup for, for a year or two? So cat um, food and ketchup. I hadn't heard that one before. That doesn't sound very, very good. <laughs> that would be bad, I gather. Yes. So, so it's, um, it's important just partially even for your own peace of mind to retire knowing exactly what you're going to live on for those first three years. So that, um, if, you know, the day after you retire, there's, there's a, a horrible market downturn, you aren't having sleepless nights, uh, trying right. to figure out what you're going to do. So the idea is you've got your bucket method and you, you suggest, you know, as a rule of thumb, one to five years in safe investments. But the idea here is at an absolute minimum, you want out of your entire nest egg, you want at least three years of it in CDs or savings accounts or things that that aren't going to go, you know, aren't going to go go south if the market uh, has some bad years. Is that the idea? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then um, lastly, uh, what would you suggest for folks? I and mean, this is a hard question, uh, but if folks are listening to this podcast, perhaps they read your book, they're within five years, 
and they, they crunch the numbers and they know they're not on track to retire with enough money. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, what, you know, that, that puts them in a hard spot. There are probably no easy answers, mm-hmm. but, uh, what are some ideas that you could give them as, as to ways to maybe address that situation? Uh, f- what I think is really in- important to do is to make sure that you know what is your bottom line. Um, so is, is your bottom line, I have to get out of this job. It is driving me crazy. Okay, that's your bottom line. What are you willing to sacrifice in order to, to retire on time? Uh, for instance, um, I, I tell this story in the, in the book. Uh, I knew a woman who uh, she and her husband had not saved enough, and then um, the market downturn really negatively affected their, their, uh, their, what investments they did have. And um, as a, a, an elderly widow, she ended up living in kind of a group home um, with very, very little. Uh, but she was content because she had a safe place to live. She had uh, three meals a day and she had access to a library. She was an avid reader. So like as she would say, as long as she had enough to read <laughs> and, and enough to eat, she was perfectly happy. So that was her bare minimum necessity. That sounds like my grandmother. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. A lot of grandmothers are kind of like that, <laughs> I think. Um, so, uh, you know, they, they get to the point where they realize what's most important. To yeah, them. absolutely. So, um, so figure out what it is, what is your bottom line? What is it that you absolutely have to have and then what you're willing to sacrifice? So for you, you know what? I can live being in this job for another four or five years if that means that I can have a, a better, um, better life in retirement. Um, so if that's something that you can do, all right, just, you know, go ahead and double down on, on, uh, on the working and, and making sure you're putting money aside, um, during that time. Uh, so if you absolutely have to live near your grandchildren, what is the least that you are willing to like to live in? You're willing to go back to, you know, not so great apartments, you know, that sort of thing that will, um, save you money. So having those really deep discussions with yourself and with your spouse about what is absolutely most important, you know, rank your top three and then everything else, how are you willing to compromise on them? Right. Yeah. You know, uh, that's a, those are some good suggestions. Are you familiar with Pete over at Mr. Money Mustache? Of course. Yes. (laughs) He's a great guy. I interviewed him in podcast seven Mm -hmm. and his story is about how he retired at 30. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. the the thing though that I liked, and and if folks are listening and you're worried about, you know, if you're going to have enough, I'd suggest you listen to that podcast too. It's, it's It's podcast seven. The thing about it is, it has. I think it has so much ap- uh, application to folks in their fifties and sixties. Say, so, well, how's that? He talks about retiring at thirty, because really, what he talks about is not retiring at thirty. What he talks about is how to live on fifty percent of your income. Mm-hmm. That's what he really talks about. And to me, that can have great applications in many different contexts. Even if, like me, I don't want to retire. I'm almost fifty, and I, I, you know, I don't, I don't want to choose to retire. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I still learned a lot from his his that podcast, and and because people say, you know, I can't even save ten percent, or I can't save fifteen fifteen percent. Of course, every circumstance is different. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you can kind of get motivated from him uh, about how he did it. Mm-hmm. And you know, I think a lot of times. We, we think we can't do something until we're forced into a situation where we really have to make some hard decisions, and then maybe we find out they're not as, as, as bad as we made them out to be. Sometimes they are, uh, mm-hmm. but not always. So Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, well, that's great. Well, listen, I want to thank you so much uh, for being on the show. You, you've written a great book that I think will help a lot of people, uh, obviously those um, uh, nearing retirement. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed the interview uh, with Emily. If you have any questions from that interview, feel free to shoot me an email, dr at doroller.net. And check out her book, The Five Years Before uh, You Retire. I'll include a link uh, to the book uh, in the show notes, but of course, you can always check it out on Amazon. And uh, if you do read the book, uh, leave her a review on Amazon. Tell her what you think and let me know. All right, so our money tip of the day, kind of since we're talking about retirement, I, I thought I'd, I'd make a money tip of the day that relates to that, and it's, it's this. Enroll in your 401k, not tomorrow, not next week, not next month, but today. You know, one of the great things about a 401k is that you don't need a lot of money to get started. You can, depending exactly on your plan, it can vary, but you know, you can contribute very small amounts of money, it comes right out of your paycheck and right into the 401k. And it's very easy to do. You don't need thousands of dollars to get started. And the other thing with 401ks is you don't have to worry about the minimum uh, requirements for a mutual fund. You know, you can start with very small amounts of money 
those minimums aren't aren't don't apply in a four hundred one k, and uh, so you can avoid that issue. And uh, one of the things I've noticed is, you know, there are studies done about what's called auto enrollment. If you're not familiar with that, it's this: some employee, employers will automatically enroll you in the four hundred one k and take out a set amount of money from your from your paycheck. Now you can still cancel that. You can go in and say, no, no, I, I don't want I don't want to be enrolled. Thank you very much. But here's the thing: for those companies where there's auto enrollment, a, a lot more people actually participate in the 401k as compared to those companies that don't auto enroll you. The, those companies where you have to enroll yourself. It's one of those things where if you just start doing it, you keep doing it because you find that you know what I can get by without that money. It's pre-tax money anyway, so I'm not losing as much from my paycheck. If for every hundred dollars you might you you might put in a 401k, you're not. Your paycheck isn't being reduced by hundred dollars. It's being because it's pre-tax. So depending on your tax uh, bracket and how much is being withheld from your your paycheck, you might you might uh, uh, have a, a reduction in your take home pay by let's say seventy five dollars for every one hundred dollars you actually uh, contribute, and you'll find that over time you just don't you don't miss it, um, and so that's my tip of the day. If you're not enrolled, enroll today and start investing in your four hundred one k. Uh, as part of that, I would highly recommend that as you get a raise each year, increase your contribution. You don't have to put all of your raise to the 401k if you don't want, uh, but try to put 50% of that raise uh, towards your 401k and continue to do that until you're finally maxing out uh, your 401k contributions. And all of this is absolutely critical if your employer matches some or all of your 401k contribution. Well, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, um, as always, email me at dr.doorroller.net. I read every email, respond to every email. Love to hear from you. Until, until next time, remember, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom. <laughs>